I heard about the presentation yesterday and the cats, so mm -hmm. I, I've tried to um, I've tried to one up Chris, and I'm going to uh, I'm going to have a slide of Steve Hoffman, so <laughs> expect, expect that later. But before I start on the presentation, um, and the real sort of uh, the guns that I want to get to, I I wanted to start off with two stories, and, and anyone who's seen any of my talks will know that I love stories and I love the lessons we can learn from stories, particularly historical stories. So um, the first story is based on uh, on a few episodes that occurred about 500 years ago. And it was particularly interesting because at that stage it was a, a very exploratory period in, in, um, in our history, history of humankind, and in particular there were certain nations who were going far and wide to try and find, uh, you know, find the far corners of the world. And the Spanish were were really the sort of leaders, the leaders of the pack. So um, this uh, this image over here is a is a painting depicting some of the adventures that they went on. And this dapper fellow around the middle, his name is Hernan Cortes. He was um, he used to call conquistadors, and uh, he was a leader of, of the Spanish Armada that went to uh, South America. And in particular, they were interested in finding <coughs> gold. Gold was was um, was was certainly, in the Spanish eyes, a particularly interesting element to them. And they they heard about uh, about the fact that these um, these Aztecs, the Aztec tribe in South America, had a hell of a lot of gold. So this this actually is a is a, a, a part of history where. Um, Montezuma II, who was the, the sort of god king of the Aztecs at the time, was offering his daughter, uh, his daughter's hand uh, to Hernan Cortes. It was a little bit of a, a strange time for everybody. Um, and uh, and Hernan Cortes was not the most moral of people, uh, and neither were these, these Spanish adventurers. So essentially what happened was, and I'm going to truncate the story somewhat just to get to the, the, the sort of main points. There's a hell of a lot more to it than this, but a deal uh, a deal went down where Hernan Cortes essentially said to Montezuma II, you've got uh, your your uh, your land here and you've got this um, it's kind of like a, you might have seen movies um, uh, where you know where they depict the, the brutality of these, these Aztec uh, God kings, where they, they do human sacrifices and all that, and you know they, they guard their gold very carefully. And what what Hernan Cortes said was, look, no more of that stuff. What we're going to do is you're going to give us all your gold, and and we'll let you live. And that's pretty much our terms. So so um, Montezuma the second, he pretty much looked at what what was in front of him, and he realized that. Look, the Spanish Armada, they're pretty much the, uh, the finest fighting force in history up until that time. So he didn't really have much of a choice. So he said, look, that's cool. I'm going to give you my gold. Let us live. And here's my daughter as well. So, um, so Henry Cortes, who, again, he wasn't the most moral dude on the planet. He basically took the gold. He then, um, he then looked at uh, Montezuma II second. Uh, and his kingdom and he thought you know what actually screw this deal and he, he killed them all <laughs> so he, he he chopped his head off and um, the rest of the guys he surrounded their city he starved them to death over the period of two years and the Aztec kingdom which had been built up over centuries and basically was pretty much the most sophisticated kingdom within that um, w within the continent of South America and within that time uh, effectively was extinct, extinguished. So, um, it, you know, for, for hundreds of years, all of a sudden these guys came in and, and just obliterated this, uh, this kingdom. So about 150 years later, uh, they, they moved through South America. Within that period of time, they also went to the Incas. You may have heard of the Incas. 
and uh, they did pretty much the same thing to them. Uh, Hernan Cortes' uh, successor, I can't remember his name, did pretty much the same thing. Said, "Look, we'll take your gold and uh, and we'll let you live." And he, he reneged on the deal, killed them all, and extinguished the the Inca uh, race. And um, and so South America pretty much became like the last bastion of of the the Spanish the Spanish kingdom. And they, they started, you know, basically taking all the gold out of there, taking it back to Spain, and uh, and and once all of that was was done, they realized that they needed to expand their territory somewhat. So they they started going north, and when they went north, they met this uh, this motley crew of gentlemen, and these were the Apache uh, the Apache warriors, and so. They pretty much did the same thing. Now, this was 150 years later, and they had had this sort of this line of success where essentially, you know, they they obliterated people. They hadn't really come up against much resistance, and these guys didn't look like they were nearly as organised as uh, as the Incas or the Aztecs. And they didn't look nearly as impressive. Uh, but what they did have in in the area, which is now known as New Mexico, was a hell of a lot of very fertile land. And as opposed to the Incas and the Aztecs, who essentially looked at their leaders as god kings, they worshipped these guys, there was no real kind of uh, community spirit other than fear. I mean, they basically, if they went against their leader, they would be killed. With these guys, there was much more of a, a kind of a community spirit that was based around their love of the land, the love of community, the love of of spiritual things and they, they had a much more free association there wasn't a single leader and when this the, the Spaniards confronted them they said look we're gonna take your land whether you like it or not and, uh, and, and you know you, you can either take it or leave it you can leave or you can stay we might not kill you we may but they weren't very famous for keeping their, their word and a funny thing happened they came ac across a, a lot more resistance than they had faced than with the, the Aztecs and, and the, uh, the Incas. They killed the leader that they met and all of a sudden another one popped up and they carried on fighting. They didn't, they didn't manage to obliterate the Apache kingdom. In fact, what happened was the Apaches retreated and they attacked. They retreated and attacked. And these Spaniards, who again were the most sophisticated fighting force that the world had ever seen up until that time were confronted and beaten by this motley crew of guys. So it was an interesting time in history and about another, uh, another two centuries after that we, we came into uh, the, the second story that I want to, I want to talk to you about um, and I'll get to the point now. now. Um, we, we had the Industrial Revolution. So at that time, there were, there were actually two Industrial Revolutions. The second Industrial Revolution is what I'm going to touch on, when particularly in the United States, there was this uh, engineering uh, mentality when, you know, we spoke about makers. Um, you know, if you want to really look at a, a culture of making stuff, uh, you, you would look about 120 years ago at the second Industrial Revolution when pretty much anyone who was a tinkerer could sit in their garage and they could they could make stuff and they could make pretty revolutionary things using the new technology of the day. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what that is, but um, anyone want to take a guess? It's what brand of motorbike? It's, it's the first Harley Davidson that was ever made. Um, and there were a lot of guys making cars <coughs> motorbikes and airplanes and, and all kinds of toys. In fact, at this stage of history, there were over a hundred uh, recognized brands of motorbike that were, that were being launched into the market. And, you know, they had, they had just this array of, of companies, engineering companies, that were starting to compete against each other. So it was an incredible time. When we talk about, about now being an incredible time, which I think it is, in fact, comparable and maybe uh, exceeding that time in terms of the internet and the, the, the digital revolution. But I think this is certainly comparable. 
And all these guys were making and selling new products into the market. And, um, and obviously through all of that, through all that competition, a couple of brands bubbled to the surface. One of the, the biggest brands at the time and the first half of last century was the Indian brand, which has actually just been reprised. I don't know if anyone's actually seen it. It's quite an interesting story. But the Indian brand was head and shoulders, the biggest and the most successful of all the, uh, the American uh, uh, motorcycle brands. And as I said, there were over 100 of them that were established and they were all competing with each other. So what happened? At the turn of this, this last century, you know, from 100 at the beginning of the, the century, how many do you think actually were in existence in America at, uh, in the year 2000? So 100 years later. 50? 30? 10? It was one. So the Indian brand basically went bankrupt. They, uh, they didn't succeed and the only brand that actually succeeded out of all of, out of, all of those hundred brands uh, was Harley Davidson. So just to give you a little bit of context behind that, this is a picture of the, um, the, the factory uh, which is in Springfield, not to be confused with uh, the, the Simpsons, but there is actually a town in Springfield in the United States. And the, um, the factory that actually manufactured these motorbikes was the size of 10 football fields, American football fields. They also had quite a few other factories around the United States. It was massive. It completely dwarfed the competition. But they went bankrupt, right? Um, the only brand to actually succeed after 100 years was Harley Davidson, uh, American brand. So... <laughs> What's the point of these stories? Harley Davidson, Apache's, you know, these two brands or these two organizations or communities succeeded against pretty stiff competition. You think of it, a hundred really motivated brands, really, you know, uh, ambitious brands in a time that was not too dissimilar to now. And 500 years ago when the, uh, you know, the, the, the Spaniards were just pretty much taking over the world and this motley crew of, of Apaches took them on and beat them. And I think there's a very clear link. And it's something that in our agency in Worldwide Creative, um, it can teach that the answer to the question, what is the link, can teach us quite a bit about consumer behavior. And that's pretty much what I'm gonna talk about today. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, uh, Worldwide Creative, we're a digital marketing agency. We've been around for 10 years now. Um, we are 50 people. Uh, we're about to be your neighbors, so it's going to be interesting. Um, and very much, we're very much like what we would call, I suppose, a pure digital agency. So all the stuff we do, we have developers and designers and you know, marketers and strategists, all based very much, uh, all focused on, um, on you know, digital marketing as opposed to I guess what you guys do, activation, we partner with a lot of agencies to do the stuff that you guys do. Um, and we work with clients like Hyundai, with American Swiss, a lot of Fashini Group brands. So we, we do Virgin Mobile. We do have quite a bit of, uh, you know, the, the sort of retail shopping kind of experience and how it's impacted. And, uh, and I think, we, you know, we're, we're basically operating in a uh, an environment where the noise is just getting bigger and bigger and over the past five six seven years you know you've probably been to a lot of talks or heard a lot of presenters talk about you know how much noise there is and the attention economy and all that kind of stuff but it is obviously becoming an increasing challenge in the same way that you know when you've got a hundred motorbike brands all suddenly pop to the surface all competing against each other um, you know you look at in South Africa alone from our perspective uh, 95% of, according to Arthur Goldstuck, he released a report, I don't know if you know about Arthur, but his company Worldwide Works is a digital uh, statistics company and he estimates that 95% of South African corporates are uh, heavily investing in digital marketing and, and with, in particular, uh, social media. So, essentially, that brings us to this idea of community 
And those of you who've ever heard me speak know that I'm a little bit of a fanatic about community. And I know that it's it's quite an overused word. So I just want to encourage you to sort of move past the cliche and uh, and get to you know why we talk about community and why it's so important. Because I truly believe that in marketing, it is it's it's the most important thing in order to sustain success. And I believe the answer to the question why did Harley Davidson and why did the Apaches uh, succeed when others failed was because they had an innate <coughs> and maybe subconscious, maybe conscious idea of what real community is all about. Does that make sense? So just to look at the word community, I mean, you know, we've, I've done quite a bit of research uh, over the past couple of years, we also have a research and analysis department within the company. Um, and a lot of the, the sort of sh the, the case studies we focus on really sort of establishes, and, and even local case studies, uh, where you, you see community really starting to happen. I mean, you see from a digital perspective, companies like Yaffe Chef, who's like a garage company, competing against the likes of Woolworths and mm. Mr. Price and so on. You know, how do they do that? Um, and I think, you know, if you look at the word community, uh, it means, amongst other things in, in Latin, it comes from this word, uh, communitas, which means to share. Um, and I think that the idea of sharing is really important uh, in terms of being successful and, more importantly, sustainable within marketing. So, at Worldwide Creative, we have seen a pattern start to emerge with the brands that we we work with in particular uh, the online communities where in any uh, digital campaign that we run there are three stages i suppose uh, that you go through the first is attracting people or traffic the second is actually converting traffic so in other words getting people to actually adopt your brand in some way shape or form. maybe not buy but you know, go to an event, sign up for your newsletter, follow you on Facebook, whatever it may be, whatever your, your goals are that you want to convert. And then the third is actually retaining it. So actually having a sustained community. And there's three verticals that bisect these stages that are super important. Um, and uh, the first is content. Uh, I suppose there's a lot of buzz around content marketing at the moment, but it's something that, you know, it's, not, it's certainly not new. Anyone who's, who's been in the trade and marketing for the last couple of decades will know that, you know, if you look at, say, you know, companies like John Brown, I mean, these guys have, have been focusing on content marketing for a hell of a long time. They know how important it is, whether it's like trade magazines or you know whether it's it's uh, online communities the content that you push out is becoming super important in a way of differentiating um, the second is this idea of strategic engagement so engaging you know from your perspective maybe it's events or you know planned uh, congregations of your community but the way you engage is super important it has to be done with you know integrity and authenticity otherwise people are going to see through it you know with all this noise it doesn't make sense if you don't do it right. Um, and then the third, which is also, you know, obviously really important, and what I think Ogilvy and you guys are really good at, is is doing this engagement and this content in a in a super creative way, in order to kind of bubble to the surface in amongst all this noise. If you're not creative, you know, if you don't understand that these ideas, these creative concepts, are are the currency of your community, then you're in a hiding to nothing. So, um, and obviously with the, the digital age, we, we now know that we can measure uh, this, all, all this, this engagement and this activity, which is, which is beautiful. Um, and at the heart of it, uh, and maybe the one thing that I want you guys to take away from this, this talk, uh, which, which is you know, the thing that I beat on all, you know, everywhere I go, I, I talk to people about this idea of cause or purpose um, and it's very really different to say a brand message you know brand message would be the the, um, the the message you choose to convey I think cause is different cause is something that 
far more sustainable. It's really the that visceral uh, understanding of what what a brand is when you feel in your tummy. This is what this brand actually means to me. So, as an example, going back to the the, the Harley Davidson um, case study, you look at why they succeeded and why through multiple oil embargoes and you know my brother who's, who's big into motorbikes says that Harley is actually an inferior bike um, why did they succeed and I believe the answer is because Harley has a visceral uh, emotional cause it has purpose it has something outside of the brand or the, the machinery or the engineering that actually makes up these uh, these products that they sell the Apaches, as opposed to a culture of fear, Aztecs and Incas, where you know you had to uh, you, you had to be part of this community, or you get, you get your heads chopped off. Um, the Apaches was was a community that was based on this cause of you know love of nature and the land, and you know it was a far more intrinsic and spiritual understanding of why they were together. And therefore you chop off the head of one of the leaders another one will pop up because it's greater than just a single person right so and you'll notice this with organizations today those that have uh, what Jim Collins called level, level five leaders Jim Collins who's a Stanford professor um, a level five leader is somebody who understands that uh, you know he doesn't take the, the, the the, um, the praise of the company. It's his people that takes the praise of the company. A level four leader who is none, no less uh, effective is somebody who's an autonomous dictator style of leader who will take all the praise, you know, and you get a lot of those kind of guys in corporate business today. Um, so cause is greater than an organization. It's greater than a brand message. It's something that's sustainable and it's, it's truly meaningful to your cause. And, I think there's a, a few examples that we can look at where you can see this idea coming through, right? So Encyclopedia <coughs> versus Wikipedia as an example. You know, the one is a is a profitable what was a profit driven thing. There's no profit to be made out of Wikipedia. It's a service and it's a service that's made up of a collective of people volunteering <laughs> their time, which is just insane. I mean the idea of Wikipedia, if you really drill down into the details, the fact that you use it so often, and I do, and it's actually becoming more and more credible as it grows older. Although <coughs> some would argue, I think there are some some glitches in the system, but you know, that's part of the nature of this thing. Um, Ferrari, as an example, you know, it's far bigger than just a machine. Uh, it has this visceral uh, response from from its community. Um, Vespa. What's what's the cause of of Vespa? Does anyone know? I mean, can anyone sort of what would Vespa's cause be? If you think of Harley Davidson, it would be uh, you know the love of freedom, the open road, that feeling that you get is not about superior technology or engineering. It's more about the you know what it says about you and, and your aspirations, right? Cheap stylish transport. <laughs> Vespa. Yeah. So here's a question for you, right? You guys, have you, have you heard of, have you heard of, yeah, cheap, I don't know about that. Um, have you, you guys heard of the brand Big Boy? Yeah. It's pretty much like a direct ripoff of Vespa. I mean, it looks pretty identical to, you know, to the Vespa products. Yet, it's a tenth of the price in some cases. So you can buy a Big Boy for 7,000 Rand, you can buy a Vespa for 70. Why would someone then buy a very similar looking uh, vehicle for <coughs> 10 times the price? There's, there's an association, right? It's a community. There's something to be said about Vespa. My good friend Rich Mahaland, I think, has also spoken here. He rides a Vespa. Um, we joke that he gets the wind in his vagina as he rides it, but, <laughs> but the point is that he's chosen to to read a to ride a Vespa, as opposed to you know something that that's a tenth of the price. Why? I think the association that Vespa has with its community is really important. I mean, it's established itself as this 
this kind of bohemian anti-establishment brand it's you know it's it's kind of in the old days was like this i don't care what you think kind of attitude and people aspire to that you know it's like the anti-brand in a way although there's a lot of irony in that but we won't get into that detail you know, brand creates a community of a community creates a brand i mean like if you think about like like harley because it's, it's a shit when i picture harley i picture like the, the bikers and the leather jackets and like the freedom and whatever but was that what they in, intended to create or did they create it and then and then harness that and then start building their brand and that i think i think it's a bit of both actually i mean so an example to do that i guess is the, the, i think the way i see a brand and the difference between brand and cause is a brand in my opinion and you know i'd love to get some feedback on this but if you look through all the brand books and all those sort of readings and every last piece of literature around branding and brand building you know it, it really in my opinion boils down to a brand is the message that you choose to convey and in that message is contained some kind of a promise and your brand lives and dies on whether or not you keep that promise right that's an oversimplification, but I think that's pretty much the key tenet of, of what branding is about. Cause, again, is a little bit more loose. It's kind of that visceral response, and, and it comes from the community. And I think, you know, a lot of uh, social media gurus will say, you've lost control of your brand, and, you know, the community owns your brand, and all that kind of thing. And I, I, I think that's the difference between cause and, and, uh, and brand. I mean, a cause is the response. It's the thing that comes from... An example would be Harley Davidson that you just mentioned. In the 70s, the reason why Harley Davidson survived uh, where all of its competitors were falling and filing for, for bankruptcy was because of its community. The word hog, have you, have you heard of the word hog, right? H-O-G, it stands for Harley Owners Group. And effectively what happened when they realized that Harley was, was basically going to go under, the community saved it. So the hog, the Harley Owners Group, started to take on board the responsibility for the company. They started fighting for the brand. Harley apparently, uh, apparently I don't know, you know where this comes from, but apparently it has more of its employees uh, with tattoos of the brand than any other company in the world. I mean, that's insane. Like, you know, would, would you go and have an Ogilvy or a Geometry <laughs> logo on your, on your shoulder? You know what I mean? Who does that? So, you don't have to answer that now. You can speak to it afterwards. But the reality is that that's, that's what happens. So, you know, there's, there's, a bit of, there's a bit of both, I think. And that's, that's what makes this idea of cause really interesting. So... Um, so Virgin, I mean Virgin is another example. I think like uh, what's the easy ride as in the movie. Yeah. I think that was so established that you read in the book. Yeah. Know, just Look, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of those types of movies which depict mm -hmm. Harley Davidson's in that kind of light. This kind of bad boy, you know, anti-establishment thing, and it's this, it's about freedom and you know sticking to the man and all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So I believe popular culture is massively important, but that's organic. So it speaks to your question of the community creating that. That wasn't intentional by Harley paying uh, Dennis Hopper to, you know, create a movie, to, you know, to amplify their brand message. Uh, it was organic, and, and and I think that's again the big difference between brand and cause. It also, sorry, sorry, um, it yeah, also yeah. became a huge part of uh, mass culture, Americana. Which you know, if you think Americana, you immediately you think Holly Davidson, big time, bald eagles, yeah, stars and stripes, yeah, and yeah, no, I, but why not Indian? Yeah, that's yeah, that's a good question. But I think that's what Indian's trying to do now. It is, they're yeah, trying to get, it's trying, trying to, to get tap into, into it. So it's much more intentional. So now it's brand yeah. as opposed to cause. <laughs> they're trying to sort of retro retrofit the cause to suit the brand, and and you know they might succeed i don't know but it's it's hard unless it's intrinsic and organic and visceral it's got to, it's got to come from within i mean virgin is another example like virgin obviously has a lot of criticism about you know it's, it's a success it's got like i think a one in two hit rate even one in three nowadays in terms of all the companies that it's it's launched but at the same time it is still a big company and its success is very much driven on that that sort of heart and soul of you know we'll fight for the little guy We'll take on British Airways. We'll take on, I don't know, NASA nowadays or Vodacom or, um, or the big banks or whoever. They always come in and fight for the little guy. Like, we'll come and take on UK trains because the government has failed. So we're fighting for you. And that's, 
that's their cause. And that's how they position every single company that they launch. So, you know, I think this idea of a cause is, is really important to, to everybody. I mean, what about these guys? Um, <coughs> this is a group. Uh, this isn't actually a real picture of a group, but there is a picture, there is a group of guys who meet somewhere in the northern suburbs uh, once every couple of months to celebrate Elvis. Like, you know, this is their cause. So, every, every year, Storm River as well. There's a, a weekend every year. I mean, it's actually in films. Beautiful. So, what about this guy? <laughs> so, I mean, look, he, he was a dick, but he had a, he had a cause, right? He managed to rally against all expectations, you know, the most vicious fighting force that we've seen in the last hundred years. And, um, and he managed to get people to do insane things for a cause. I read a biography of, of uh, this dude last year, and it was fascinating to hear, and one of the things which actually blew my mind was that, you know, he, he regaled against the, the, the sort of uh, anti-Aryan, so whether it be Jewish, or whether it be black, or whether it be anyone who's not this sort of German ideal, um, he said if it, if it weren't for, say, the Jews, he would have picked another one. And you think about how loose that is. It's just crazy. But yet, he managed to somehow, you know, rally people around a cause. So, um, <laughs> what about this dude? Okay, I don't have cats, but I got Steve. So, Steve, I mean, he's creating a community, whether you like him or hate him. He's producing the community. He's, yeah. he's producing the community. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> There's a great poster. It says something like "Opas ikus talki opa." So, I mean, yeah, he's he's a bit of a chop, but he's he's actually quite remarkable in terms of railing support and 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 uh, getting a community around him. So, I have a question: Would you say like forming that community is what would sustain? Um, a business or a brand beyond the decline phase because you find that a brand becomes successful yeah. and then somehow it fizzles out and then the, you have that core community that that, that those people who, who, who love it yeah. and then somehow maybe they they they, they I don't know but they, like they, they 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 cause that fire to be to start again and then yeah. somehow down the line that brand rekindles rekindles its fire and that's, I mean that's a really big. good question I think that you know an example going back to the Apaches right Apaches, they were this proud community of people who were deeply respectful for nature and their land and all that. And now they're a shadow of that. And, you know, the guy, one of the guys in that picture was a guy called Geronimo. You've obviously heard of the name Geronimo, right? So he was their most famous uh, leader. And he was at the latter stage of their, their sort of um, their decline, really. Um, and what happened was he was like this figurehead of all these guys and the industrial revolution started to happen around the Apaches and you know they weren't so interested in all of that they were interested in nature and all that sort of thing they were much more interested in like the things that always uh, stood them in good stead and so what happened was they, they fell they actually veered away from their course they started to Geronimo became a drunk he actually became a, a, um, a circus performer they used to take him around. It was it's a super sad story if you want to if you want to check it out. But you know he he went like with a circus and people would go and see him uh, because he was this famous Apache guy and, and they were plying him with alcohol and you know so it's a very sad thing and I think that's a key pattern that you'll see in a lot of brands that have a very intrinsic visceral and meaningful cause uh, when they veer from that then you'll notice that they will fall. Um, and I think that's what happened in the 60s, uh, the, the sort of, sorry, the 70s uh, with Harley Davidson. You know, they started to mass produce a lot of really crappy bikes. They started to emulate the Japanese rivals and they started to lose their, their cause. And, uh, and it was saved by a group of people that actually brought back those values. Um, Apple is another story. I mean, there's loads of stories that, that sort of, so, so yes, I do think that you'll see cycles that go, but the ones that are sustainable are the ones that have a very, uh, a 
very well-defined cause and a, and a strong community rallying around those causes. So if we look at why, um, I think the first is that a cause is super profitable. You just need to look at a, at a company with a strong cause. Um, you know, like, I mean, I mentioned uh, Yuppie Chef, for example, their cause is customer service, and they're super profitable. Um, you look at Harley Davidson. I mean, Harley Davidson, an example that comes to mind is that I think it was the 1997 uh, uh, Super Bowl. You know the Super Bowl, right? It's the most expensive advertising spot that you can buy. And in the Super Bowl, uh, they organized 100 Harleys to drive around the field in the, in the, at, at half time. And they televised it for free um, because they just wanted the association with Harley. So I know I knew the, the marketing director of Ferrari down the radio, the Villetti garage. Uh, they were the, you know, the agents. And Reinhardt used to tell me that every week he used to get magazines and newspapers asking them, asking him to place his ads in their newspapers and magazines for free. You know, and you're talking about a hell of a lot of free advertising. So it's super profitable. People just, there's an allure there that, that becomes profitable by its very nature. So, um, yeah, another example is uh, uh, when you've got a strong cause, um, Apple, for example, which, you know, I suppose it's, it's about functional, beautiful technology, right? Um, as opposed to Microsoft, I don't know what the hell Microsoft's cause is, is. But the Apple annual Macworld conference costs a fraction of what Microsoft and, and Nokia's uh, conferences cause because they just have the simple uh, event where they announce the, the product and that is just televised and streamed and shown and blogged about across the world um, because that's all they need, they're focused. Sorry, wouldn't it be that a cause and a community are interconnected because Very much so. you talk about Apple, I mean, as a community, certain people, it's targeted at certain people, so the causes that are important to them, obviously that to that community yeah. would then be profitable, same as with Harley Davidson, because it doesn't necessarily appeal to everyone, or Benz doesn't appeal Absolutely, to everyone. Absolutely, yeah. The two aren't necessarily mutually exclusive, mm -hmm. they're actually connected. They're, 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 I would argue that they're always connected, so that a community cannot exist without a cause, or certainly <coughs> wouldn't be sustainable without a cause. So you can, as an example, in digital marketing, you know, the most commonly used phrase from a like a social media guru or whatever it would say like let's create a community around your brand but if you don't have a uh, like a, a cause yeah. I mean your brand is one thing and that's super important I'm, I'm not saying that it's not but I would argue that a cause is more important <coughs> you know if you've got something that's strongly defined people will follow you and it evolves I mean, it's and it, not static. It, can't it be takes some <coughs> nuance and meaning and idiosyncrasies come out of that you know which are unique to those communities which is just a beautiful overflow of an authentic overflow of when when you're doing it right. And the community, sorry, and the community actually um, tells you what the cause is by listening more, seemingly sometimes. Strategic engagement, so that's that central vertical. It's all about listening and then engaging, not about bleating and shouting and you know blaring on. So you got to understand what's happening and you know the beauty of, of also digital is it allows you to kind of measure a lot more effectively and be both proactive and reactive so but i think so just bit, i think that of course why the companies are really successful is the ones that have taken it from the course for for a very small group of people and have amplified that massively i mean if only bad boy hairy bikers bought harley davidson they wouldn't be the company they are today, but they've tapped into the mindset, which is in bank managers and teachers and whatever, all over the world, that they also want to, for a few hours on a Sunday morning, have that experience. And I think Apple did exactly the same. They took it from, you know, Mac sitting on the desk of a few designers that thought they were incredibly cool, and then, you know, amplified it through, you know, iPhone, iPod, all that kind of thing. Theirs is desire, apparently, their cause is desire. Apple is a great, a great case study in, in that regard because it shows you both sides of the cycle. I mean, Apple in the 80s was exactly about cause and community. It had a very fanatic, fanatical group of fans uh, who used them, particularly in the design community. And then they fell. I mean, in the sort of mid 90s, they really fell to the extent of bankruptcy. I mean, maybe not such a well known story as that Bill Gates bailed them out, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. So, at that stage, they had such a vast array of products. They were so not part of what the Apple stood for, like printers and handheld devices and all kinds of 
you know, silly things. And the first step that Steve Jobs did when he came back was reintroduce the cause, that beautiful functional technology. We're going to focus on not 100 products, but four. So he whittled it down, he totally stripped the company clean of anything that wasn't aligning with the cause. And so therefore that the original community started to grow in strength to the extent that it's now one of the five biggest companies in the world by market yeah. share. And I think the one that's very relevant for us is Malpra. I mean, Malpra have managed to retain this sense of cause and they've now, you know, they're the, never mind cigarette brand, they're the sixth, fifth or sixth biggest brand in the world. Yeah. And they have this absolute mandate. They only bring out one product at a time and they focus on it and they build it and it's only when they're strong that they start with something else. And they've yeah. very much done that. They've retained through all of the bad, yeah. you know, the, the bad news that can affect the sector. Marlborough has still retained that kind of brand cause. Yeah, absolutely. And I would also add that within dark marketing, I would say that this idea of cause and community is possibly the Strong. most important thing that's, that, you know, people in companies like BAT and, you know, Distel and whoever need to grasp now because that's going to help them to sustain through the next 50 to 100 years and get them, you know, bubble to the surface. If they don't, they're going to fall. If they don't have a cause and a community, they will fall. And it's got to be clearly defined. So, if you put it in the context of social media, for instance, yeah. traditional media, it would then, I suppose, a cause bring into how traditional media would be pushing advertising versus social media, people will be putting it because that's relevant to them, which is, I suppose, within the dark market and for yeah. the background what you want. But it's not just social media, I think it's just social interaction. So it's effectively any kind of interaction between, see the holy grail, and this is important, the holy grail of community building or, or you know, getting this right is when the members within that community start talking amongst themselves. So it's a conversation they already have. Exactly, and they're talking about you, and they become your ambassadors and advocates, and you know, I mean, you start to see it. You'll see it in a, in a community that's actually effective, where there's criticism, and as opposed to like Abs's social media page, you know, where everybody's just flipping, nailing the brand, you know, you'll get people actually fighting for you. And it's outside of your remit. You know, you don't have a social media going, I'm oh, sorry for all the bad service you had at you know, teller number five. So I think that's that's a huge difference is when the guys actually start, you know, highly owners group. They start rallying around your brand to save you. And um, I think, you know, just to run through the, these reasons, I mean, it's compelling. I love the, the, the saying, the Johnny Walker thing, you know, uh, the, the whole world follows a man who knows where he's going, you know. I mean, that's effectively what it causes. And at the same time, I think, you know, it helps you as, a, as from within an organization, at, within my agency, we're trying to actively create a cause uh, and a community around us with our Heavy Chef initiative, which you may or may not have heard of. If not, follow us on Twitter and, and Facebook, but, um, and subscribe to the newsletter. Um, <laughs> So they're amazing free talks. They get like brilliant, brilliant people from around the country and from overseas to come and just share knowledge with you. It's free to attend. You just sign up. It's on the first come first serve basis. And the next one's on dark marketing, just by the way. So. Super, super worthwhile going to. But you need yeah. to be super quick. Like when you get the email, sign up immediately. Otherwise, you yeah. Like, you'll miss we, out. we only have I think it's two hundred and fifty seats, and they get booked out within like twenty minutes or so. So. Yeah, but anyway, so it helps you make tough decisions. So if you are aligned to a particular cause, like say Steve Jobs, you know, when he saw this array of 100 products, he brought it down to four because he knew that those are the four that align to the vision or the cause or that meaning that you, you, you have within a, a strong functioning community. Um, a great uh, anecdote was uh, I saw, um, what was that, that TV show with... Uh, uh, with the American tycoon Donald Trump, um, the one where he goes, "You fired the the Apprentice, right? The Apprentice." So they brought on Rudy Giuliani, who is the erstwhile mayor of New York, and um, you know he's he's widely recognised as a pretty good leader, pretty strong leader. And all the guys who were in the Apprentice, you know, they were trying to get the job. They they asked him one one question that they asked him was. Um, what makes a good leader? What's your greatest leadership lesson? And he said, know what you believe in. 
because in times of trouble, it really helps you to align your thinking and your focus and helps you to make key, tough decisions. And I think that's one of the most important lessons you can learn. So if you know what you stand for, it helps you to make decisions on the marketing messages that you have, what kind of products you release, what kind of events that you run, what kind of activations that you have, because do they align to your cause? And if they don't, then don't do them. Um, a cause polarizes people, you know? I mean, you just look at the conflicts going around the world, um, you look at any kind of religion, uh, but it also helps, it connects people in a, in a visceral way. Like Harley Davidson, it's not everyone's cup of tea. My brother hates Harley Davidson, he loves the Japanese models, but he still has respect for the fact that people really flip and love this brand, you know? Um, a cause is sustainable, as we've proved, you know, over a hundred years where everybody else is failing. Um, you look at, say, for example, uh, a great example is Apple versus Dull in the, in the mid 90s. Dull was very, very much about production and focusing their production techniques and, uh, and sales. So they had the, the most respected sales force in the world at the time. They were really, really good at providing you with the product that you wanted. So they would tailor it to your needs, right? Um, and Apple were like, no ways, we're going to create four products that are basically the way we want them to be and, uh, and we're going to create this, this culture around these products. And look at where Dell is today and where Apple is today. So, I mean, there's a lot more nuance there. But Sorry, just on that, hmm. um, do you not think that causing uh, or creating a community yeah. and, and establishing such a large community around your brand does that not also make brands lazy? Taking Apple, for example, they created um, over the past 10 years this amazing community. And in the past, what, two years? They've gotten a little bit lazy in, in their cause and what they're actually putting out there. They've made a few adjustments on their things and launched it. Everyone's gone, oh my God, that's amazing. But now a lot of people are getting over it. They lost a lot of share in the last launch. And I mean, that, that could cause. They're riding on their morals in many ways. I, they're, not, I, they're not really doing anything. Their cause for me was so innovation, they, coming up with something new and different that stood out from the market, and now they're not even standing out on their own products. <coughs> and they survive post jobs. I, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah so look. <laughs> yeah, I do think that there's often <coughs> a, a very close link between the leader and the cause, mm -hmm. and I think time will tell how effective they are. But I mean, if you want to place a bet now and say which in 100 years will be the more successful company, Samsung or Apple, I don't know, I would say that if they stick to this, see, I would argue that it's not so much innovation as in like beautiful functional technology, that it's something that's really like you want to own because it makes you feel better about yourself. That's not innovation. That's more about, because they are not, they are most certainly not an innovative company. They are a copycat company. Yeah. So they copy, they borrow, what is it? Great, good artists borrow, great artists steal. I mean, they steal. And then all their good stuff is, is stolen. Like the iPad. <laughs> yeah. The iPad was not the first. The iPhone wasn't even the first. I mean, so, so they stole a bunch of stuff and they brought it together and made it beautiful and functional. And just like it made you proud to own it. So that's very different, I think. And also, just being in mind, they haven't released a new product in two years, but it was correct me if I'm wrong, it was I think five years between the iPhone and the, the iPad. So you know what I'm saying? I think they wait, they, they look, they learn, they perfect, and then they release. I watch, I mean, everybody knows it's coming, but why did they not race to and scramble to beat Samsung? Because Samsung have launched this product that, I mean, I've seen it, it's, you know, it's, it's okay, I mean, it's nice, it's innovative. But I would, if I was Apple, I'd look at it, I'd borrow, take, 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 and then make something that's super rad, you know? So, anyway, that's a lot more of a nuanced discussion. I mean, I'm sort of looking at the top line thoughts here, but, but again, I do believe that history shows us it's sustainable. And also, just in general, it makes life more meaningful. So, an organization with a, a proper defined cause that's visceral, intrinsic, and it, it has some kind of emotion uh, attached to it, you know, it just makes it better to work with the company, to buy products from that company, to work within that company, to be an employee of that company. I mean, if you think of uh, the agency environment, right? I have a friend who I've known since school days, and he's created a company, a very successful agency in Cape Town. 
And their currency is ideas, their cause is ideas, and beautiful concepts. They turn away clients who want to do run-of-the-mill boring stuff. And he's created, you know, I would argue, you know, the second most creative agency <laughs> in South Africa. What is um, this agency? <laughs> uh, it's Fox P2. Oh, okay. So, and um, yeah, I, I don't want to finish my story now. I didn't want to. I don't want to reveal too much. But look, the point being is that I think what what you know in terms of working for them, people want to work for them because of what they stand for, not because of what they pay them. If that makes sense. So, and that's a very, I mean, that's that's a very strong proposition. So, um, okay, so why should you focus on building a community? Uh, McKinsey says that, it's, that um, you, it's, you're nine times more likely to buy a product from a brand that you know, a community that you're part of, um, than a, comp a competing product. And again, I mean, I, I've used the analogy already, looking at Dell and, and Apple, which one would you want more? Nowadays, despite Dell's unbelievable engineering prowess uh, and its sales mechanisms, you know, in the last 20 years, I think Dell, you know, they, they haven't really shown that 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 pure focus on engineering and productivity is going to sustain them. You know, I think they, they, their market share has declined so much to the day that. They're a fraction of what what Apple was, and they were huge in the in the nineties. Um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you.